Hello everyone and welcome to The Bubbling Adventure, a podcast all about kids and how educating them positively can impact their entire life as well as society. Each week we're having conversations with guests on different themes and our aim is to have open discussions, share different points of view and learn in a non-judgmental way. Today we're welcoming Dr. Nick Houghton who will tell us about positive education and positive psychology how its principles are applicable to the different stages of life, whether it is for a child going to school or an adult going to work or simply just someone part of any community. The best way to support this podcast is to subscribe if you haven't already and write a review if you're listening from Apple Podcasts. But without further ado, let's begin. Maman, maman, en cette chanson Papa, papa, en faisant cette chanson. Maman, papa, maman, papa. Great, Julie. Nice to be here with you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Sure. So my name is Nick Holton. I am the Associate Director of Positive Education at the Shipley School, which is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the United States. And I'm also a consultant and a coach in the world of, I guess, sort of flourishing and, and peak performance. So I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching with the Flow Research Collective and work with different businesses and organizations, um, all with the intent of focusing on any sort of science that really sort of looks at the combination of well-being and peak performance. And the combination of those two things is really sort of what we refer to as flourishing or, or thriving. Wow, interesting. That must be a lot of work. So could you please... Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's very fun and, and very rewarding work, uh, which is why, you know, I do it. And it's really sort of something I think I started feeling and experiencing uh, even as like a pretty young guy. I grew up in, in Michigan, you know, a state in the Midwest of the U.S., You know, I can trace it all the way back to really being about 12 years old and going out in the, the front yard to help my sister with, uh, I was a pretty good soccer player, or I guess, you know, what you would call football and Uh, right. Yeah. The, you know, the real football, as I would, I would say, and just tried to coach her up and help her a little bit with some things. And she went out later and had a pretty good game. And I just remember thinking, you know, as a young guy, like thinking, oh, I caused that. Right. I did that. <laughs> like, I, you know, I was the reason that, that she had a good game, which probably wasn't the case, but it was enough for me to feel what it felt like to help somebody level up to help somebody kind of get better in a way that they valued and they cared about. And I think from there, the trajectory was always sort of headed in that direction. So by ninth grade, I, I knew I wanted to go into the world of education and, and become a teacher because I really felt like that's what teachers do. They help people kind of, you know, level up and hopefully become better versions of themselves. And uh, I taught history for about a decade. And while I was teaching, I, I went back for a master's degree and tried to explore this idea of, I guess, sort of self-actualization or becoming, you know, what it meant to help kids become their best selves a little bit more. I wasn't really satisfied with, you know, the, well, I really got no answers, but the answers I thought I would get, I wasn't really satisfied with. So then I went back for my PhD and it was uh, during my time pursuing my PhD that I discovered the term flow, which is really sort of a, a psychological state in which we feel our best and perform our best. I started really studying that. I started studying intrinsic motivation and eventually uh, the study of those two terms really led me to the world of positive psychology And then sort of all, you know, these different branches that really all speak to flourishing, which, like I said, is, is not only feeling good, but sort of functioning as our optimal selves and doing great things and 
feeling really great. And so after that, I, I just kind of took it back into the world of education and started positive psychology and positive education program at the school I was at in Los Angeles. That's where I was teaching at the time. And through a series of events, eventually got connected with the Shipley School, which is sort of, you know, the American leader in positive education, which is flourishing, you know, infused into educational practice. And moved out here to Philadelphia to join them and, and start to kind of push things in the world of positive education forward a bit more. Hmm, interesting. And that must have been a massive decision for you to even go back to school yourself and work on your PhD. So well done for that. And from what I understood, you said that you found out about positive education during that PhD or did you know before? Yeah, I mean, I like to think or I tend to tell people if they're asking about a doctoral program that the only real reason to go back for a PhD is if you have an intellectual itch that you really want to scratch because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of studying of something pretty small, pretty specific that most people are never going to read or see, right? And so it's, it's really got to be intrinsically driven. And when I went back, it was really because I think I felt a little disenchanted. I felt like I wasn't really helping people sort of, you know, move towards becoming their best selves, really hitting peak potential in the way that I wanted to. And I wanted to better understand some of the science behind that. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know all the language behind that uh, or even really any of the language behind it. I just felt like, I guess, you know, I wanted to keep learning and keep studying and keep trying to, you know, deepen my understanding of those sorts of, you know, phenomena. And, you know, just really sort of got lucky. And, you know, you mentioned it was a big decision. And I always sort of in my classes and stuff teach a bit of the science of luck, you know, which is uh, Richard Wiseman, who's, who's actually in the UK where you are. And, you know, he talks about traits of lucky people. And one of them is they trust their gut. They follow their intuition. And I think there was something that was always sort of nagging me, kind of saying, like, there's, there's a little bit more to know. There's always more to know, right? But there's something really tugging at me, saying there's a lot more to understand about this. And then, like I said, I just sort of got lucky during my studies to discover terms like flow, like intrinsic motivation, like eudaimonia, which I eventually wrote my dissertation on, which goes all the way back to Aristotle. This is essentially happiness we experience from being deeply engaged, from cultivating ourselves and developing ourselves in ways that allow us to contribute to the greater good. And once I discovered those terms, you know, that was sort of my entry point to, you know, the, the science of flourishing as a whole. And from there, it just spiraled. How just a then evolve a journey and like a path in life so one question i assume you but even more often as i do what is positive education sure sure yeah well i mean i'll just i'll first speak to you know what you just mentioned there which which is great you know how one sort of thought or one kind of i guess itch can really blow up into this big thing and, you know, I, I, it's worth mentioning to your listeners that that tends to be the case with a passion and certainly, you know, flourishing education, the study of optimal sort of functioning is absolutely a passion. We tend to develop it over the course of time. You really, it's, you know, we hear all these beautiful stories about people who, you know, discover their passion at a young age or pick up a basketball, pick up a football, you know, play an instrument, whatever it might be. And they just know that's how they want to spend their lives. And those are, are romantic and lovely and, and whatnot, but they're also, they tend to be the exception. Mm -hmm. And certainly that was the case with me where over the course of time, I think a simple idea really blossomed into, you know, fortunately what I get to do every day now. But more to your question here. So positive education technically is really educational practice and pedagogy that is infused with and integrated with positive psychology. And positive psychology is one of the main fields that it studies the good life, well-being, what it means to sort of like look at our strengths, how to get into flow and develop peak performance and things of that nature. And really the best way to understand positive psychology is, is just kind of with a quick history of what traditional psychology has mostly been about, certainly, you know, kind of in the United States, 
which is the study of ill being, sort of the father of the field, Dr. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania down the road from us, stood up in front of the American Psychological Association and basically said, we've spent decades studying how to fix the bad, right? How to make miserable people less miserable. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's, it's created all sorts of amazing results that have helped hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people in a variety of ways. All he was really saying was we need to develop the other side. We need a new lens and a new paradigm through which to sort of develop psychology, to view the human experience. And then it sort of got the name, which which frankly, I think is a little unfortunate of positive psychology. That doesn't mean all other psychology was negative psychology. And it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't mean that, you know, to be happy, to be our best selves, that everything needs to be positive. Mm -hmm. It simply is a field that is devoted to understanding the components that help individuals, communities, nations, organizations be their best selves, right? Function at a really high level and feel good doing it. Hmm. Yeah, that's a lot because, so what I always say when someone asks, this is my definition, but for me, it has to have an impact on individuals, but then also on society. And I mean, it's not just changing one's life, then it can, you know, it has a huge effect. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, happiness can be, and this is why we don't really like the term happiness, right? And why I think you combine the idea of well-being with optimal functioning and peak performance, because just chasing and pursuing happiness can be an incredibly selfish pursuit, right? And ironically, I think what we know in part because of a lot of the research from positive psychology and other fields is that one of the greatest ways to, you know, develop well-being, to cultivate meaning in our lives is actually to do for others, to perform acts of kindness, to, you know, look out and support and take for others during times of stress, to respond by reaching out for social support or giving social support. And so, you know, I think that's where, to your point, kind of that purpose motive, that purpose orientation fuses so well with a system like education, you know, at its best, and education is certainly not always at its best, especially in the U.S., education, I think, is really intended to be sort of a societal changer, right, and a a support mechanism that really helps advance the lives of individuals in a lot of great ways, no doubt, Mm -hmm. um, but more than anything to really advance society as a whole, whether that means sort of that, that nation level society or a local society, or even, you know, more of a globalized society like the one we live in today. So I think it's a really nice, natural, organic marriage for something like positive psychology to exist in the system of education and, and hopefully kind of change and revolutionize it. Yeah, no, totally agree with that. But so could you please tell us how do you help? Like, what is your job on a day to day as a positive education associate director? What is it exactly? Because I'm sure many of us are familiar with this job. I mean, I had never heard of that before. And I think it's brilliant that some schools you know, have that because I wish I had had that (laughs) when I was at school because I think school can be great, but also not necessarily adapted to every single one of us. Yep. So yeah, you get that a lot and that question comes up a lot. So, you know, positive psychology has been around for not even 25 years yet. And, And in terms of science, it's still a very young field. Positive education has been around even less, right? So, you know, knowing first and foremost that it's young. And then secondly, that, you know, there are some cultural implications and oftentimes some tension with some cultural attitudes that, you know, really turn into it not being as widespread right now as we would like it to be. So it's, you know, it's not too surprising that you haven't heard a lot about this yet. Although I will say there's a lot of positive psychologists, positive educators, flourishing educators in the UK, you know, that we could talk a bit more about. But really sort of, you know, the the magnet right now is Australia. There's a lot happening in Dubai. There are multiple different nations that have ministers of happiness, ministers of well-being. 
And, you know, for whatever reason, I think some of it cultural, the United States is a little bit behind in that way. So, you know, Shipley is really one of the only K through 12 schools in the United States that's pushing this thing forward. There are other schools, like I believe the Hill School in Oklahoma City, and a few others sort of smattered around, but you know, Shipley's really leading the charge in that way. And then there's some higher education, so colleges and universities that are really helping to push things forward. The Science of Happiness is the most popular class at Yale. It was the most popular class at Harvard. It's pretty widely taught, just not as widely practiced. And so at Shipley, the way we think about that and organize that is uh, the director of positive education student support is Dr. Sharon Russell. And she's been at Shipley a long time and really kind of uh, helped get Shipley started down the road of social emotional learning through a curriculum that we call SEED, S-E-E-D, social, emotional and ethical development. And every Shipley student goes through a lot of seed classes every single year. Uh, we believe it's sort of a, a core piece of character development and, and hopefully their eventual psychological and sort of just general life success, right? So Dr. Russell really focuses primarily on the student level, student experience, a lot of the student curriculum, and then I tend to focus mostly on the adult level. So, you know, you mentioned sort of the community level of things. We like to use the phrasing that positive education uh, really needs to consider the me, the we, and the the. And what we mean by that is how we're giving individuals, the me, the tools to empower them to become their best selves, mm -hmm. how we are really sort of emphasizing and, and reinforcing the V, which is taking care of each other in the context of a system and an organization and community. And then the we, which is policies and practices, pedagogy and guidelines that really help the ecosystem sort of flourish and reinforce flourishing individuals, right? And that we part on the adult level is really kind of where I'm focused, right? So, so Dr. Russell, Sharon, and I really focus kind of students and adults, parents, alumni, faculty, and staff, leadership, and then obviously the hundreds of students that we have. And we try to make sure that positive education is really incorporating everyone so that Shipley is not just a school, but it can hopefully down the road become an exemplary ecosystem. Hmm. Wow, yeah. And so do you organize some specific activities that are proper to the me, we, the? Are they like any examples so that we can visualize? Yeah, there's a lot of different things that we do. One of them is to try to consistently ask how people are doing, right? Assess well-being, assess their satisfaction with certain things, assess the extent to which they feel that they are or are not flourishing. So, you know, a good example would be that, you know, I work with one of our data coordinators to really try to tap into that on the colleague level. How are you doing? What could be better? What could maybe shift or change, right? And then bring that to, you know, the, the primary leadership team and fuse it with things like organizational psychology and positive psychology to provide recommendations and then maybe some, you know, some tips and some tweaks. Sharon then would work, Dr. Russell would work on the student level and just did this recently and collects a lot of the well-being data. And then we would bring that to colleagues and teachers and leadership positions as well, right? Mm -hmm. So just the simple act of consistently seeking not only feedback from both students and adults, but seeing how people are doing is sort of like the most obvious way of going about it. But there's there's lots of other little things that, you know, seem kind of simple, but they can, you know, ultimately have a big impact that our data coordinator, as named Josh Barbarian, had a wonderful idea that really comes out of the positive psych sort of science, which is gratitude. And our Shipley School logo is, is the Gators, so we call it Gator Gratitude. And essentially, just every week, adults on campus can nominate another adult and simply give them a shout out and express gratitude for them for a particular act 
doesn't need to be very profound, can be something simple, but we just really try to encourage people to both notice their gratitude and express their gratitude. And then of course, it feels nice, I think, probably to be on the receiving end of that gratitude as well. We do that on a weekly basis. We teach positive psychology on the student level. We teach different professional development sessions and learning bites on the adult level. We will be rolling out classes for our parents and for our alumni, for instance. So, you know, sometimes it's programs, sometimes it's teaching and learning, right? Sometimes it's policies and and tweaks. It's really thinking about all the sort of the tools at our disposal and the way the science can really help kind of improve and enhance some of those things so that both the individuals and the collective can flourish. That's ultimately the Shipley definition. I think success, it's what we call educational excellence. There's three legs of of that X stool as our head of school, Michael Turner likes to say. The first one is academic achievement because ultimately on some level, that's why schools exist, right? But I think what makes Shipley quite unique is that the other two legs are individual well-being and collective well-being, mm-hmm. right? And so we consider all of those alongside and parallel with one another. And I think if we can get all three of those really right for all mm-hmm. of our sort of stakeholders and constituencies, then that's where we're really going to see flourishing on, on both the individual and the communal level. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And I also think that it's such a great idea to involve adults and parents because then they can actually apply that at home. And so the kids get more consistency, you know, it's really ingrained into their lives. And it also, I mean, it has also probably a bigger impact on even more people because then they would also, I imagine, you know, tell their neighbors, their aunts, everyone and apply these principles. So I think it's, it's amazing. It's very inspiring. Well, thank you. We, I mean, we certainly are excited about it and, you know, motivated by it. And you're exactly right. You know, we, we only have the students for so many hours in a given day, and they also need to focus on a lot of the important, you know, content areas that they're being exposed to. And so, you know, having time with parents and having time with alumni is a really critical piece. And, you know, in the past when I've taught those sort of groups, you know, there's multiple really kind of purposes to it, which on the one hand, you can say like, here's some, you know, education and flourishing, positive psychology, whatever you want to call it, so that you might use it in your parenting. But also like, you know, parents and alumni are, are, are busy, stressed, you know, people that we care about as well. And we also want them to learn these sort of things for their own personal mm. benefit, right? They're members of our community too. And, and we, we are of the firm belief that, you know, when, when you try to treat every single member of your community and constituency group as if you want them to be the best version of themselves, not just, you know, be happy, but also be functioning at a high level, that's where you're going to see the biggest ends. Yeah. It's what it's what Sean Aker refers to as big potential, right? Individuals have enormous potential, uh, no doubt that I think that's the fundamental assumption of, of pause psych, but it, you know, it, it really kind of pales in comparison to the big potential that comes from, you know, teams and groups and communities and ecosystems full of individuals who are flourishing, who are really crushing it and, uh, you know, functioning on a really high level. And so I think, I think ultimately Shipley is after that big potential. Yeah, that's nice. It sounds great. I love that. (laughs) And so do you have any advice to give on that? I mean, I've always got advice, <laughs> right? The, you know, here's, here's what I'll, I'll try and give a couple different things. You know, yeah. I think dovetailing off of that comment about big potential. One thing I think is really important for your listeners to realize is that, you know, there is a lot of wisdom to the old saying that we are sort of the average of the five people we spend the most time with. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's, it's not that simple, of course, but the point I'm making is that our happiness, our productivity, our success, our achievement, you know, the extent to which we are our best selves and sort of living our dreams and crushing it is very, very much affected uh, by the people we are surrounded by. Our happiness is interdependent with those around us. 
Our achievement is interdependent with those around us. And so, you know, the simple way of saying that is, you know, pay attention to who you surround yourself with. It impacts your beliefs about yourself. Yeah. It impacts your habits. It impacts your motivation. It impacts your goals. It impacts so very much. And it happens to be that relationships are, are really the number one predictor, not only of happiness worldwide, but of job satisfaction worldwide. We tend to, to really need to like the people we work with and for. And you know, this, the second piece of advice I'll give is to really sort of understand one of the fundamental models or frameworks of flourishing out there. And it's a pretty simple acronym to remember. It's called PERMA. And uh, here at Shipley, we use PERMA plus. And, and so it's P-E-R-M-A plus. Mm -hmm. And the P stands for, it really stands for positive emotion, positive affect. We tend to feel good and be our best selves when we're experiencing lots of pleasant feeling. That said, Dr. Russell likes to say, and I totally agree with her, that the P is, is really better thought of as purposeful emotion. And the distinction there is that not all good things in life come from pleasant feeling. Mm. So a simple example would be stress, right? Stress can be an enhancement. It can boost motivation. It can boost focus. It can boost productivity. It doesn't feel good, but it can lead to good things, right? So it's not just yeah. positive emotion, although that's a big part of it, uh, but purposeful emotion that helps you be your best self. The E is engagement. This is essentially flow and eudaimonia, which I referenced earlier, this is finding things that we can become deeply engaged in. A lot of times it's creative pursuits, playing an instrument, writing, playing sports, things of that nature, ways we can experience flow, that psychological state in which we feel our best and perform our best. Mm -hmm. The R is relationships, which I just mentioned, having high quality connections, love, intimacy, a sense of belonging, a sense of connectedness. The M is meaning. So, you know, this is really a belief in and a desire to contribute to something greater than ourselves. You referenced earlier, right? It's, it's great to, you know, be happy or whatever, but there's also sort of a, a transcendence that I think is in place for a lot of people who are functioning on a, on a really high level, feeling really good and ultimately flourishing. And that comes in the form of meaning and purpose. Yeah. The A is accomplishment. And, and this doesn't necessarily mean awards. It's certainly not just, you know, financial success, although financial health has some implications on happiness. It really means, you know, leveling up, acquiring skills, accomplishing goals, having a sense of competency. And then the plus is really, you know, comes down to things like vitality and health. So this is good sleep, good nutrition, moving, exercising, and maybe most importantly, you know, for your, those of your listeners sort of tuning in here is taking breaks, allowing yourself to recover. I think, you know, that it's a common misconception that you should just grind and grind and grind and eventually, you know, good things will happen. And, and don't get me wrong, there's really no escaping hard work when it comes to being your best self, whatever that means to you. Mm. But you can hit a point of diminishing returns, right? You can take that too far. And so taking breaks, having recovery, doing things that nourish, you know, the body and the mind and the soul are really important to flourishing as well. So that's, that's really the PERMA plus model, you know, that we've sort of taken from the University of Pennsylvania and Dr. Seligman and really kind of adopted, you know, here at Shipley as well. And I am going to adopt it as well because I really felt every word. And <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's, it's great. And I think it's, I mean, even the first advice is very applicable to like everyone, Yeah. parents, kids. It's, I, I really like that. It's, yeah, I, I shall meditate on that because <laughs> I think we, we all yep. should. It's very interesting. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned meditation. And so let's make that a third piece of advice, which is mm -hmm. it's so much easier to be aware of, focus on and take advantage of the components of PERMA if you can live and exist mindfully. Yes. And, you know, that can come in the form of meditation, but mindfulness as a practice can come in a lot of ways. And I think one, you know, sort of, it's not so much hidden benefit of mindfulness, but it's something people often don't consider is that the practice of mindfulness is really the practice of paying attention. 
And if you can improve your ability to pay attention, then you will notice more positive or pleasant or unpleasant emotion. You can sustain more focus that gets you into flow or deep engagement. You can enhance your relationships because you're actively listening, not passively listening, and you're paying attention to the emotional and social cues of other people, right? You will achieve more because you can focus at a higher level and retain more, Think, things of that nature, right? So mindfulness as a practice is really, I think, at the core and an essential tool of not just positive psychology, but flourishing as a whole. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a, that's, that's a great little tidbit. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think yeah, meditation is is for everyone and is uh, adaptable, you know, to every age and you don't need to do one hour especially if you're five years old. But having at least mindfulness and be able to process emotions is very important. So thank you for all of that. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of things to to think about now. So thank you so much. Absolutely. No, it was my pleasure. You know, if, if your listeners want to reach out, they can always get in touch with me. Uh, feel free to, you know, provide my email, but it's just nholton at Shipley School, N-H-O-L-T-O-N at shipleyschool.org. And uh, we're always happy to, to try and help out, provide advice where we can, and, and really just sort of, you know, help spread the, uh, the science of flourishing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Feel free to share if you think it might be helpful to someone you know. If you enjoyed this episode, then please make sure to write a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and subscribe if you haven't already. That's it for me. See you soon with the next episode. And in the meantime, have a lovely day.